course. I'm delighted. Okay, I clicked the got it. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be in conversation with all of you today. And I look forward to hearing from many of you, even if this format sometimes feels a little distanced. So don't be shy when we, I'll speak for about half an hour and then we'll move to about half an hour of discussion. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see that? Is it full screen? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Okay. Um, to start with, okay. Um, I speak from occupied land. Stanford is an uninvited occupier of the traditional and unceded lands of the Movekma Ohlone. Joseph M. Pierce, citizen of the Cherokee Nation and associate professor of Latin American and Indigenous Studies at Stony Brook University says, quote, an acknowledgement is not the same as a relationship. Land does not require that you confirm it exists or that it has been stolen, rather that you, that you reciprocate the care that it has given you, end quote. I'm grateful to be a guest on this land and commit to solidarity with indigenous and other marginalized peoples who have lived on and cared for this land, water and air. And while we are on the topic of land acknowledgements, I wanted to share the scathing critique of land acknowledgements. I'll give you a moment to read that um, because it's become just so pro forma to do a land acknowledgement. But given the essay you read, I think we need to think deeper about what it means. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to look at that. Um, this was in a presentation by Akhil Gupta, who is president of the American Anthropology Association uh, from his address to the association last year, which was titled Decolonizing US Anthropology. So I hope you can see where um, I'm coming to this um, inflection of the land acknowledgement from. Um, and I believe all of you have read and, uh, and one of you did a presentation on my essay of Pedagogy of Reparations. So I'll touch on some aspects of that, and then you can bring up questions and discussions since you've read the essay. And I'm also gonna to touch a bit on another essay that I published this year uh, to do a quick overview of these two essays that are kind of tied in with each other. And the other essays called Smuggling, Infiltrating, Usurping, Why Globalizing the Film and Media Studies Curriculum is Essential to Decolonizing It. And so we can think together about these two essays based on the presentation that I'll do um, just now. And because I built, as you saw, pedagogy of reparations with a whole bunch of quotes, I wanted to kind of have a dialogic relationship to actually model in the writing of the essay itself, what I'm saying we need to do collaboratively, students, faculty, administrators build together a more reparative pedagogy for film and media studies and filmmaking. I believe many of you are filmmakers, um, both Professor Shankar and I started our careers in filmmaking and video production. Uh, and so I've had experience on that side of the aisle as well. And so I bring to film studies that old love, not just cinephilia, love of cinema, but also a love of filmmaking. Um, so I look forward to hearing from you about your thoughts on how, how this speaks to making practices that many of you are engaged in. So I have here a quote from Toni Morrison that's in the essay and another one from Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, who is a South Asian historian. Um, and to even make them speak with each other coming from a kind of uh, African-American tradition and a subaltern studies his historical tradition is an interesting conversation. Uh, Toni Morrison says, canon building is empire building so that you cannot separate the violence of canon building, of propping up certain texts as the most important, the most impressive, the most worth studying from the violence of building empire, of taking over, of occupying lands. And Spivak says, the willed autobiography of the West masquerades as disinterested history, so that what we study as history is actually an autobiography just of the West, of how our entire knowledge system is occupied by Euro and now increasingly in the past decade, um, centuries, um, US, Euro-US knowledge systems or epistemic frameworks, right? 
Um, so these essays, the two essays that I am referencing that are my own, which is a little strange, but it's led to this kind of workshop format, I think, because many of us are rethinking how to teach, how to be students and teachers in a new kind of space and world. And they came out of a moment for me that contains thoughts and feelings that I've had for a long time, um, especially around, around being that international student or faculty member who does what people would call specialized study of Indian cinema. Oh, that's the Indian cinema person. As it happens, Indian cinema is only the biggest and among the oldest film cultures in the world. So to think of that as marginal or peripheral itself indicates to you this kind of uh, willed autobiography of the West, right? Um, but the voice in which I've written these pieces, which is new for me, and I just almost felt like a speech writer, like I was writing a manifesto. Um, it owes a lot to the uprisings that followed the police murder of George Floyd. Um, and the, we had a bunch of town halls in our department. Um, I also studied many student petitions that circulated, especially in the US and the UK. There was a return as well to the South African movement, Roads Must Fall, uh, which those energies were um, brought back again with the toppling of statues in many places, if many of you saw that on social media as well. Right. Um, so th that's the kind of mode in which this is being written. And I want to hold on to that mode of writing and speaking. And I'm interested to hear how you think what has happened in the last two years, a sudden kind of awakening to questions of systemic racism, um, to questions of misogyny. I mean, our politics has kind of brought that to the fore with all the conflicts around Roe v. Wade, trans rights, etc. how that's affecting your own practice is something I'd love to hear. Um, have any of you watched Raoul Peck's Exterminate the Brutes? If you raise your hand, I can see you. Okay, it's really fabulous. It's a four hour documentary on HBO. I highly recommend it. Um, so in this 2021 film, Raoul Peck, who's a Haitian French filmmaker says, uh, I was watching it while I was working on these articles and this quote from the film felt most appropriate. You already know enough, so do I. It is not knowledge we lack. What is missing is the courage to understand what we know and to draw conclusions. So in film and media studies, which is what many of us study, we have read long enough and for, you know, we have read enough and for long enough about the urgent and imperative need to dismantle our Euro-US curricula and our film canons, what are the great films, etc., and to address the violence of treating some parts of the world as the center of our knowledge systems and others as the periphery. And we have read enough to know that we need to smash white supremacist, heteropatriarchal, colonial ways of knowing and being in the world. So it is not knowledge we lack, right? It is, it is the courage that, um, that all of this calls for to build a new way of thinking and new ways of engaging in the classroom. What I'm calling a pedagogy of reparations recognizes our current teaching frameworks as centrally occupied and dominated by systems like white supremacy, Eurocentrism, but also other occupying structures in the rest of the world. Uh, for example, caste, which I'll talk about in the South Asian context, ethnicity. Um, there are ethnic major majoritarian systems that impinge on minorities within other parts of the world, other regions of the world. And this percolates into each of our syllabi, thesis projects, films, our own methodologies and systems of thinking. After all, it's our curricula and syllabi that decide within the university context, what is good taste, what is high and low art, what is good cinema. Each classroom and syllabus goes on to constitute the structures of our discipline and of the university. For example, in the course that you are taking, which uh, Dr. Shankar shared the syllabus for, if you hadn't watched Moonlight and Get Out and Divine Intervention, Persepolis, I just saw that you have watched these films, if you had instead stuck with the traditional film curriculum, and I'm just throwing out some names of filmmakers that I love, but that otherwise just become the center, like Hitchcock, Orson Welles, Jean-Luc Godard, et cetera, you know, often, um, intro to film studies or filmmaking courses might center these filmmakers and have just a mere sprinkling of non-white, non-Western, non-male filmmakers. 
you would then go into the world with a very different sense of film history. So I want you to think about this question of the pedagogy of reparations within the context of this very course that you are in right now. These two articles I'm discussing today were also inspired by the many student protests and petitions, as I mentioned, at multiple institutions over the past two years, including in town halls in my department. It's a department of art and art history, which has a film and media studies programs program. We had really vociferous undergraduates, in fact, who sent faculty a PDF with their demands. And these various petitions at multiple institutions included demands to foundationally and radically diversify syllabi. You've seen this in the essay already, uh, some of the demands made by students uh, that just some superficial tokenistic reform is not sufficient, not just adding one or two texts, the infamous kind of race week or the week we discussed queerness, but the rest of it kind of establishes the center as heteronormative, white and Western. Um, how to centrally include in our methods, courses, decolonial and anti-racist theories, to not sideline these as special topics for special weeks later in the course, but to center them front and center. I talk about the first day, first image, for example, initiative later in the essay. Um, there was a demand from students who are very smart about what needs to change uh, to hire faculty, that BIPOC faculty at senior positions so that they can be in decision making positions in the university. Um, and also to change distribution requirements. I don't know what your distribution requirements are, but we had a whole bunch of European and US art uh, requirements, 19th century, 18th century, Renaissance, early modern. And then one of the six requirements was non-Western, which was initially called um, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. So that the you know five of your distribution requirements are Euro US centric, and then one is the entire rest of the world. That gives you a sense of the center periphery logic that undergirds all of our um, education systems. And I wanted to bring here one of the things that I was very struck by in the indigenous scholar Sandy Grandy's uh, comments in a Zoom talk that I attended last year, she said we should also be wary of what she calls death by inclusion, that representation can so easily become assimilation and you can lose your identity. So she said we also need to be wary when we are BIPOC folks of not getting assimilated into the center, of not wanting to occupy the same structures of power. So how do we insist on being there and yet not being co-opted into certain knowledge or belief systems? And that's a really tricky thing that we, we're constantly negotiating. Um, but I think one of the things I wanted to highlight here is how students forced us to think about what our foundational film and media texts are, right? It used to be a very set, if you look at all your textbooks for film history, film art, uh, film analysis, it's a standard text of Euro US canonical films. And that has begun to change now. Your syllabus is a great example of that already. And then very quickly, the kind of uh, points that I made about a reparative pedagogy in the essay is that institutions like to forget. They very quickly want to move away from this racial reckoning moment to go back to business as usual, to go back to the status quo. Um, so our work, if we are interested in the pedagogy of reparations, is to keep remembering, witnessing, and take, undertake the constant work of care and repair, right? And instead of being defensive to kind of acknowledge various complicities that many of us bring into this arena so that it just doesn't become an us versus them binary, but we all bring into our conversations the multiple histories that we come from. And that is one way to critique these epistemologies or ways of knowing the world that have become hegemonic, that dominate our entire understanding. Instead, we need to cover a wide range of histories, genres, media traditions. And I mentioned how we need to study, not just watch films or other media texts. I watch a lot of uh, YouTube videos and TikTok videos and Insta reels with students as well. <laughs> Uh, to globalize is to actually understand what contemporary media production, including social media production, is in the rest of the world. So that we, when we watch, say, one film, I'm going to say, for example, Rafiki, a Kenyan film that I show, 
it doesn't mean we have covered and we can put a check mark on Kenya. Oh, I know what happens, what goes down in Kenya, right? It needs so much more work to actually look. And I think social media is a great space to understand what's happening with pop culture in the rest of the world. And so these would be ways to move away from minor curricular reform, from just making these small changes. There are two articles I cite saying, just making new lists of best films or films to watch that are global doesn't fix the problem because then we just create, like, like Sandy Grandy says, we just um, mimic these same hegemonic power structures. We don't step away substantially from this whole way of seeking visibility and fame that produces certain kinds of toxic environments. Um, and centrally need to divest from binaries of form and content. Oh, we can just do pure aesthetic readings of cinema. We just need to study, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, makeup of a shot. And all of this is exciting to do. I do it in film analysis. I really enjoy doing short breakdowns and sequence analyses with students. But to not separate that from the political, cultural content that these uh, shots are emerging from. So that we don't think, say, for example, a long take, it means the same thing in Hollywood as it does in a Thai film from, to, from the 2000s, right? Those are two very different cultures. They do speak to each other in some ways, but they're also very emerging from very different contexts in others. Um, and so we need these textured global histories if we want a reparative pedagogy. I have the Juan Monroe uh, quote, I think, in the essay um, that none of this should just be the work of an individual. I realize many of you are students, and this was sort of written in a way for faculty, but it, I think it makes sense for all of us to think about this. Some of you may be mentors and teachers in the future or already are. Um, so it shouldn't, the burden should never be on just one person. Um, and as Dylan Rodriguez says, there is no such thing as an individual abolitionist, right? This is always collective work and therein lies its power. Lily Saint and Bhakti Shringar Pure in, um, in, a, in a great article called African Literature is a Country say, individual departments must be willing to alter their definition of diversity itself, to decolonize diversity, because all of our DEI committees and initiatives are basically about oh, this kind of coverage model. If we have one of each, if we kind of check off gender, sexuality, race, et cetera, um, then we have addressed the problem. Instead of thinking about continuing tensions, we need to decolonize this very notion of diversity. Um, and that takes us into a, a very uh, tricky, messy, but productive terrain to hold on to the complexity of engaging with our differences and our commonalities. And then I have a slide that I edited out. Uh, this is some content that I removed from the essay because of the word limit, but I wanted to touch on here. And I believe this image is from Divine Intervention, which you just watched, I think. Um, and I'd included it here because of Ilya Suleiman's own self-reflexivity about the complexity of being a Palestinian filmmaker. Um, and this is a quote from Bambi Haggins, who is a film scholar, who says, recognize your own positionality. You have to know where you're speaking from. Recognition of our own points of enunciation is important so that each of us brings a dense history to this work of decolonizing, de-westernizing the university. And I myself write as an Indian born academic with certain caste and class privilege. I was trained in part in the US as Professor Shankar mentioned, and I'm employed by the US Academy, right? And so it's this history that accounts for the frameworks and examples that I have included in the essay. Each of you, if you were to write a similar essay, a kind of meditation on what your entire education means for you, you will discover what are the centers of your education and what has remained on the peripheries or what you completely don't know at all. So as that is why I like engaging with people around these questions because we bring multiple histories and conversation. And so obviously every call to action is informed by these intersecting histories and frameworks that inform every author's formation. Our strategies for repair cannot and must not be universal, but be specific to the conditions in which we teach and study. So there is no one size fits all fix and I talk about, I cite Teju Cole in talking about the problem with the word fix. 
My own pedagogical or teaching practices have shape shifted when teaching in various types of institutions, for example, in Trinidad, in the Caribbean, in India, in Massachusetts, in California. And each of these classes and the strategies were different in response to classroom and regional dynamics around race, class, caste, religion, et cetera. <clears throat> so in the US, I am an immigrant woman of color, but I also wield caste privilege. The, the caste system is very central to multiple religious communities across South Asia, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, et cetera. Um, and so it's my caste privilege that enabled my English language education, which is hard to get otherwise, and, and my higher education migration to the US, right? So the very fact that I'm here speaks to certain kinds of privilege that allowed me this mobility, whereas someone else probably has to travel as an undocumented immigrant um, to say work in a restaurant in New York City or in Toronto. Um, so each of our access to various kinds of educational uh, infrastructures is also determined by these very histories. And this is true for every one of us. And this is why I was saying complicity is really central to kind of clarify what worlds we come from. When I teach courses on South Asia, it is critical that I discuss the specificities of caste and how it plays a role in scholarship, syllabus design, and thus canon formation. And this is work that is still very new within our field of, say, Indian cinema studies, where the canon is very, so it's not enough to just say, oh, at least there, white supremacy doesn't have as much of a defining role. Um, it's a bunch of brown people deciding what their canons are. It's only when you pay attention to that local context, you realize many of these are people who are dominant caste. Um, and the filmmakers, the film scholars, all of us who have access to these networks bring a certain caste privilege that is being challenged now by, um, by the formerly untouchable called, uh, as a political category called Dalit or Bahujan or Adivasi, which is a, a ter another term for indigenous peoples. Um, and this would be the case if you considered Brazil, if you considered parts of the global south have other vectors like race at work. And it, it often might be caste, ethnicity, and religion at work in these places. Um, and so only when we pay close attention to local dynamics do we develop a more complex sense of the rest of the world. And we don't then flatten places and identities into just uh, binaries of liberation or oppression, right? Um, I discuss in the essay de-imperializing theory so that we don't just apply what is very typical in grad school of applying theory to all texts, which is often what is masquerading as universal, but is actually Euro-US theory. And how do we think about these various turns? And so there is a psychological turn in film and media studies, a philosophical turn, a formal turn early on, etc. All of these happen in certain contexts, certain scholars in certain universities in the global north or the west. Um, have been central to these turns, right? So how would they apply, say, to uh, a text from, a film text from Turkey? Um, what are the kind of connections, but then what are the blockages between these spaces is something we need to think about. So we need to centrally kind of think about globalizing theory and think about, for many of you as filmmakers, this probably comes naturally to recognize media texts as products of labor and material practices, which means we don't just read films as the visions of directors only, but who else is working? What is the rest of the crew on that film? And then the crew is not just limited to the credits, right? Because that also fixes, we, may, we always are turning, making someone else's labor invisible um, because we celebrate, at the most we celebrate in addition to directors, cinematographers, editors. Sometimes our directors, if you're doing a popular cinema like Indian cinema, which is very invested in music and dance, um, the music composer is central, uh, but all of the other labor that goes into making and who typically do women get to, uh, why are there not as many female cinematographers, right? Why were women always kind of pushed towards editing? So what are these histories of labor and material practices? What are the gender and sexual kind of uh, politics of who is included and who is excluded from these histories. We need to think about the density of all of this as we um, study film and media texts, which are very complex. 
And I speak uh, about this being a uh, kind of community practice. And I turn to Fred Morton and Stefano Harney in the essay, if you remember. I say deoccupation or decolonizing is a, is a praxis founded on radical love and unbounded sociality. So we need to think about collectivities and socialities. And some examples are the Synagogia um, syllabus bank of um, syllabi on Latin American film and media. For any of you who are interested, go look it up. It's a really fantastic database. And then um, the Southside Home Movie Project from Chicago, which was uh, one of the founders of this initiative was Jacqueline Stewart, who was a professor at the who is a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, so these kind of uh, informal learning networks may begin to repair our relationship with communities kept out of our institutions and disciplines. There are some communities, we know this based on race, caste, and location, who are kept out of these higher education institutions that we find ourselves in. So this might also be worth thinking about in our discussion. What do you think in your practice you can do to engage with communities outside of the university, outside of film festivals, um, outside of these given institutions that we work within. And um, I wanted to turn to an example very quickly. I'll speak for a couple more minutes and then we can move to discussion. This is drawing from the other essay on how globalizing the curriculum is absolutely essential to decolonizing it. And we need to kind of take over courses rather than push all our uh, global world cinema texts into a separate world cinema course, which is what most film and media studies curricula do. We need to globalize every one of our core courses. So for example, next spring, I'll be teaching my Indian cinema course as a core film analysis or close reading course so that students are forced to take it and they don't just think of this as, oh, that's just a national cinema course, right? Which is not given the same hierarchy of value um, versus say film theory, which is then often just Euro US film theory. Um, one example is uh, a queer cinemas around the world course that I teach uh, because queer cinema and queer theory courses tend to be so Euro and US centric. Here is an example, and these are texts that I'm very fond of, but I'm using them here to indicate the gaps. So the Oxford Handbook of Queer Cinema of its kind of many long sections, finally towards the end has a small section of four essays on global queer cinema. The rest is Euro-US centric and white Euro-US centric. There's only one essay by Kara Keeling on black queer history. Um, so this is to indicate to you uh, very visibly in publication, this kind of center periphery dynamic, or this other book, an earlier text, Queer Cinema, the Film Reader, which does not touch at all upon global cinema, but its title does not indicate that this is only a Hollywood cinema reader or a you, you know, it doesn't say queer cinema in Europe and US, you and, and the US. Instead, it just takes over this universal name, but actually doesn't address entire swathes of the world. Um, that is the decentering, that is the um the kind of invisibilizing of entire parts of the world that uh, we are talking about with the pedagogy of reparations. I've included here just a description of a course that I teach called Queer Cinemas Around the World. Um, so we have film and video from Kenya, Thailand, India, the Dominican Republic, China, Brazil, Canada, Palestine, Japan, the US, et cetera. So the US just becomes one more of many places uh, that we're going to study uh, you know, texts from. And the, the reason for move, doing this to look at, at a whole set of queer identities and practices is to move away from a homogenous understanding of what queerness is. And so the hope is to actually ask, what is queerness by turning to these this kind of proliferation of texts? Let me show you some of the images of um, some of the films that are part of that course. And film festivals like the Queer Kampala or the uh, there's another um, festivals. So we did do a whole section on queer film festivals in Africa and in the global south. By doing this, we really question what is queerness? What is cinema? Because these each of these films is very different in its formal characteristics. And what is the world? Can we ever completely encompass or understand what is that project of studying queer cinemas around the world? It builds a deep humility about 
knowing how little we know, but how exciting it is to go to step into this huge expanse of cinematic, of media experience, right? Not all of these are films in the traditional sense of being shot on celluloid, et cetera. And it also then makes us pay attention to differences between regions so that there are at least, say, for example, five films on the African diaspora in this course, but they're from Kenya, Africa, and the African diaspora. Kenya, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, Hawaii, um, I'm trying to see what else is there. But and and uh, we have Cheryl Daniels, The Watermelon Woman, so African American lesbian film history through a film. Um, and so you suddenly begin to see differences and commonalities, even within this group that we call the African or the Black diaspora. And that complicates, makes so much richer our understanding of global blackness. Um, so these are the multiple ways in which kind of globalizing a syllabus is important. The first day, first image, uh, you can look this up online. They have an Insta page, um, or is it an Insta account, whatever that thing is called. <laughs> um, and so I took some of the learnings from this from after writing Pedagogy of Reparations, my own teaching and syllabus making practice changed. So I opened the queer cinemas course with these films, Rafiki from Kenya and Sand Dollars, Dolores de Arena from the Dominican Republic, so that the rest of the course is infused with this queer third world sensibility that centers the experiences of Black women, some of them identifying as lesbians and others maybe not. Um, I had some discussion of this, but I'm going to skip over it. If we have questions, we can come back to this. But basically, the course then emphasized the importance of studying different regions. Rafiki, for example, has an Afro bubblegum aesthetic. The filmmaker Banuri Kayu is very insistent on on um, on kind of foregrounding fun because that's not something people think of uh, in this human rights frame of Africa that needs to be saved. Queer people in Africa need to be saved, right? Or in the Middle East. Um, so the course is trying to question all of those stereotypes. Uh, and by going from across, if any of you have seen Sean Baker's Tangerine, the first film to be shot on an iPhone, um, which is about two uh, black trans women friends in LA, Moving from there to Kenya to this uh, still from a film called Irata Jibidam or Double Life from Kerala in India. Um, moving across these regions makes us pay attention to vernacular sexual figures so that people, sexuality politics is very specific to per particular regions. And we need to understand those regions, not just watch films as if they all come out of just some cinematic universe, right? They're deeply in conversation and in intimate conversation with local publics. Um, and here are just some observations on what happens when we go global with asking these questions. So Migdashi and Jasbir Puar, for example, ask how might we develop queer studies that are not always already American in orientation, that do not reduce areas and their subjects to case studies and that do not assume that the United States is the prehensive force for everyone else's future, right? So how do we do this work of paying attention? And then what other kinds of queerness become visible when we do this? And then Neil Banji, who's a South Asianist trans scholar says, who is the correct and proper citizen that gets to speak in the name of a transsexual subjectivity? How do we account for the different imaginings of transsexual mobility within a locality? So this emphasis on the local, on the region, um, is all extremely important to gender and sexual politics as well. <clears throat> I end that essay, I just put this up here. Um, so we kind of go into discussion with a sense of how to bring a global pedagogy of reparations. Um, when we commit to rebuilding our disciplinary foundations with an internationalist decolonial vision, a lot of there was a the the black the third world US um, the the third world US uh, kind of radical moment in the seventies where poets like Audre Lorde, June Jordan, etc., also emphasized that many minority communities within the US actually could be identified as third world communities, right? So there was an emphasis on internationalist solidarity. So when we kind of rebuild our foundations of film and media studies with these internationalist visions, we will invest then material and intellectual resources on infrastructures of translation, subtitling, and access 
because folks will often say, but where do we get the DVDs? They are not subtitled. How can we access Japanese articles on anime, not only read white Western scholars writing about anime, right? How do we read local um, film criticism? Uh, I just watched, for example, Park Chan-wook's decision to leave last night at the movie theater. And I just saw a whole set of reviews of the film in The Guardian and The New York Times. But what I wanted actually were South Korean meditations on the film. I want to hear how they are placing it within the oeuvre of the rest of his work. Um, and so all I could find was an interview with him at the New York Film Festival where he has a translator. You begin to see how your access to criticism and knowledge is so limited by language um, and by what becomes, uh, what gets centered constantly, even in our expansive world of in the internet. We owe this, actually, this expansiveness to our increasingly racially, ethnically, regionally, sexually diverse student bodies, to all of you, we owe this. While attacks on critical race theory, minority rights, indigenous ecologies proliferate around us, we know this, um, our film and media studies courses offer portals to smuggle in vital frameworks of resistance and dissidents from around the world. So we need to look at these not just as, oh, I want to know what films from Uganda look like, but there's a profound sense of a new kind of collective that can emerge by watching these films. Um, I'm just closing with, su with some words from the great abolitionist uh, thinker, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who has done fabulous work on incarceration, for instance. And she says, abolition is figuring out how to work with people to make something rather than figuring out how to erase something. Abolition is a theory of change. It's a theory of social life. It takes us back to that a point about these are acts of sociality and collectivity, right? These are acts of love between communities to build better worlds. Um, so I'll stop there and um, we have some time for discussion. Um, thank you so much, Usha. Thank you so much. You don't even have to turn the camera on, but thank you so much. We learned so much from you, listening to you. Uh, I'll just throw it out to the audience because we are at 4.45 and I know we have only an hour with you. So Alexis, please. Uh, thank you so much for that. That's so like, inspiring. Um, so my question is, you're talking about like, you need to increase engagement, right? So thinking of not just within like students, but also like our colleagues and, and peers. So my question in your like work, if you have any thoughts or like advice, is how do we increase engagement without antagonizing? Because I'm just assuming that the students who want the change, they are being vocal. But really what that work really like is those students who are not as uh, vocal up front or may not be as enthusiastic for, for that work. So I'm curious in, in your work, how do you approach that? I think you need, thanks for that. I mean, these are, and it, I often, when I workshop this material, I just feel the Q&A format is so antithetical to what we are saying it should even be. So I'm saying right up front, I don't have answers to these questions. I'm giving, and I love that you framed, this, framed it as how do you approach this? All I can give you is my approach. And then every time I take away uh, strategies from the audience, from all of you, and to hear about how you do this work. Um, but I think the question of who is vocal, who is visible, all of these are exactly part of the problem of uh, who gets visibility, who feels they are. When I came, when I was a uh, faculty member initially, I didn't realize only some students come to office hours, for example, because they feel entitled to the faculty member's time, because they're not possibly first generation college students. And so they know this is a space that they are entitled to, while other students felt kind of um, shy about approaching faculty and felt like they should not impinge on their time. So these just alert you to all of these histories that we bring into the space of the university. We don't come all come into it with the same background and the same history, right? Um, so you actually need multiple strategies. What we have done in the past two years is have a um, 
a DEI committee, which there are all the critiques of DEI, but we still need them. And I'm constantly holding both reform and revolution together. I don't need to uh, toss out reform, which has its own purpose alongside the more radical potential of revolution. Um, so the DEI committee, for example, meets, does a town hall every quarter. And because we know not all students will want to speak, whether it's in person or on Zoom, we have a form that you can fill in anonymously beforehand and, and that you can keep filling in during the conversation. Because even on Zoom chat, students are wary of putting in because then they can be identified by their name. Um, so you have all of these multiple strategies for folks who don't want to be identified, who don't um, feel like they have access to that space to be vocal. Um, and sometimes to your question about enthusiasm, this is the point, one of the points in the essay is like, don't expect BIPOC folks to help you de-imperialize your Euro-US curriculum, right? The op because the opposite of enthusiasm is exhaustion. And a lot of BIPOC students, faculty, just people out in the world say they're exhausted from having to explain uh, to oppressor communities um, what they need to do to fix their history, the histories that they come from. And I take this to heart because when I mentioned my caste privilege, when I am in a Dalit space, uh, the, a, a space where caste oppressed people are, uh, are telling us about their experiences, you just hand the mic and you listen. So listening and being quiet and becoming small is also extremely important in order to actually open the space and open yourself to listening to other people's histories and experiences. And it takes, it's just constant work to learn how to become, to be both, you know, uh, inviting of all kinds of participation um, and to not kind of take over that conversation. Thank you so much um, for talking to us today. Um, what really stuck out to me is your um, globalizing theory and being for theory because um, I'm a TA and I get to create my own film course. And so I was interested in applying film theories to making your own films. And so the theories I was looking at was auteur theory, psychoanalysis theory, Soviet martial theory, um, which I'm realizing now is like more Western Eurocentric, especially with auteurs like mostly white men in that space. And so I thought like diversity that uh, curriculum could be um, queer theory and feminist theory, but um, like you said, um, queer theory doesn't, is more Eurocentric is what you found, and so that's why you made your um, queer cinema around the world theory um, class, so that was really inspiring for me, so I was um, wondering like what steps I could take to make sure that having a globalized curriculum. Thanks for that. I, again, it's always work in progress and it requires so much more research um, into then finding what are the other theoretical frameworks. Actually, I feel we fundamentally need to question what we think of as theory. Um, we, we seem to have some settled notion that we all know what, what constitutes theory and what is its other, which is say history or studying culture or politics. So theory itself, the very notion of theory with a capital T comes from a certain history of European philosophy, right? Which was this kind of spare, let's just think about the act of thinking and about concepts. Um, and the black radical tradition, for example, black feminist scholars say you can never theorize without thinking about praxis simultaneously. What is the impact of this, these systems of thinking upon the world? And how do we develop uh, kind of, or, or for example, they will say dance is a certain kind of theory. Moving with your body in the world is theory. You don't need to sit at a desk like Immanuel Kant to produce philosophy or theory, right? So that we really expand our very notions of what theory is. And for many of you as practitioners, I hope that feels empowering because your act of filmmaking is a theoretical act. In theory, in that sense, would then be any mode of conceptualizing our practices that fall into certain kinds of patterns. Um, but having said that, I know when you're designing a syllabus, students also want, you know, if you're getting a master's um, from a university, you are expected to be 
literate in certain traditions and those traditions continue to be uh, belong to a certain kind of center. The other act I do is, like I said, I don't throw out reform in my desire for revolution. It's not that I throw out all my Euro-US material, but I situate them within their histories. So that if we are studying, for example, um, Friedrich Kittler, who is a particular media theorist, um, or uh, Ali Fear Eats the Soul, right? You watched Fassbender's film as your first film. It's a fabulous film. Um, and Fassbender is an open gay filmmaker, but the race politics of that film and how he acted, how he behaved on set with his Black actors who were also sometimes his lovers is an important contextual question. So we don't just isolate the film as a text and only read that, we go back to the actual production histories. So if we can do that with films, why can't we do that with theoretical texts? Um, so when you're teaching Deleuze, for example, what are the fil films, film traditions that Deleuze is familiar with so that when we read his two cinema books, we understand that this is a particular theorization only of a small corpus of texts that Deleuze has probably never watched a Bollywood film. And if he had, then his theorization of cinema would fundamentally be altered. Um, so you can still teach psychoanalytic film theory, but kind of locate it within its particular history and context. And this goes for any other kinds of theoretical frameworks. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I think self-reflexivity is really at the heart, both being reflexive about the text that you choose. We also often pause uh, in the course to think about the sequence of the course and think about, oh, if we had changed this, how would this the, the shape of our thinking in this course have changed? So I taught queer cinemas around the world for the first time last year, and I'm going to teach it this year. I already know it's going to change dramatically because by the time we came to the Hawaiian film Kumuhina, which is about a trans woman who is a teacher of indigenous practices, um, many of us, the students, felt that should have come much earlier in the course before we watched the Brazilian film Bisha Traveshti, uh, which is about a trans Brazilian woman, and that these two films should be speaking to each other, right? So it's only in the process, rather than thinking of a syllabus or even a film as a completed product, we think of all of this as a process. The same film, if you made it 10 years later, is going to be very different, right? So it's much more open-handed, flexible, amorphous, if you come to it with um, with this kind of lens of these being malleable objects that we are not defensive about. Oh, I created the syllabus. How can, you know, you can't point to its failures. But if we kind of embrace the queer art of failure itself as productive, as generative, then we uh, produce very different kinds of work. Any other questions, comments? Stephanie, please. Um, Yes, thank you so much for this absolutely fantastic talk. Um, just so many wonderful things to think about to take away from today. Uh, I, I'd love to hear more uh, that you took, touched a little bit about this of uh, DEI committees and the role of sort of the department in thinking through these changes. And you, and you mentioned briefly about the town halls. I would just love to hear of, of strategies that are currently being put in place and what that process has been for you in this sort of learning and listening. And, I just love to hear about your experiences with that, what you, uh, what discoveries you've made. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think about what rises up to the top as um, really important. I think the first thing, and this was um, the day George Floyd was murdered, my one African-American colleague, which already says a lot for a department with 26 full-time faculty and just one black faculty member, um, who is a photography um, professor, organized the first town hall because he knew he needed community and he knew the black students in our student community needed to be, needed the department to show that they cared um, and that we were listening. And there was just a lot of pain and it wasn't enough to just have one town hall. That town hall lasted, I think, two hours. Many of us wept. We inhabited very different spaces than we do in a typical university setting. So we brought our entire selves to that town hall. And then we discovered we couldn't stop. So we had to do three continuous days then of town hall because there was just as a, an outpouring of pain, of rage, 
not just at you know what was happening in the country but within the department within the university um and then this as it goes on over months and years it kind of conjoins with student activism on campus around defunding campus police for example and then different faculty have different political engagements so some might engage more or less but the DEI committee then becomes a space where students and students are centrally part of that committee so it's uh, run by faculty staff and students with a representative from each of the undergrad specializations the MFAs and the PhD students so that it becomes a, a kind of uh, by design, a democratic committee with multiple voices. Um, and so, and it can be a space of discomfort. And discomfort is absolutely important to doing this work, right? You, if you're comfortable, you're not doing the work. Um, and each of us might feel uncomfortable in different spaces, which is why there isn't a, that's why I said there is no kind of simple space of this is a liberatory, lib, uh, you know, kind of position, and this is an oppressive position. We kind of go across these multiple positionalities in the different spheres of our life. Um, and I think what's been very helpful is for students to hear other students' voices powerfully, rather than in the classroom where it continue, the hierarchy continues to be a one to many, like me to you right now, right? The town hall is a much more decentered space, um, and I think that fundamentally changes. And the, the it's really important to keep that intentionally keep that culture of openness because the university will come in with its standard framework of DEI committees do this kind of work. Um, so to, to kind of create that circle rather than a linear hierarchical communication is very important. Thank you. Uh, we are at five o'clock, Osha. So I, and I know you are uh, backing a cold, so I won't uh, exhaust you anymore, but if you have, you'd like to share any concluding thoughts, we are happy to give you that space. And thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you all so much. I have spoken long enough that I have no concluding thoughts, but just go into the world as filmmakers, scholars, media makers, whatever you do, um, kind of filled with this um, kind of, um, infiltrating smuggling energy of kind of you know i call it in this essay smuggling essay that's why i call it smuggling infiltrating usurping things are not going to be given to you you have to fight for it and sometimes you have to find other strategies like under the radar infiltration uh, but to go in with a spirit of joyous usurpation right and um so go to for all of us who are constantly learning to go into the world with that uh, there will be Sarah Ahmed's complaint that I mentioned in the essay. Um, this is these are not easy spaces, um, and they, you will experience all kinds of pushback. But I think find your community, find your undercommons, a coalition of complainers to do this work with. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. And I'm going to log out. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm going to end the meeting and you can log out and I'll talk to you. Later.